Hey guys, Level Cap here. Today I have a getting started guide for Hunt Showdown. I've been having a lot of fun with this game lately, and there's a surprising amount of depth and atmosphere to the game that I wasn't expecting at the start. There's quite a few growing pains that you're going to go through once you get into the game, and I think this video can help alleviate many of them. Let's start off with the basics. The controls are a little bit weird. First of all, left click instead of just being shoot is actually melee. So if you have a weapon out, you will melee with that weapon. Holding Left click will actually charge your melee strike. Meleeing for the head of a zombie or an enemy player will do increased damage. The same applies to firearms and many of the weapons in the game will one shot headshot your enemies so it makes sense to aim for the head or wait till your target stops moving to take that perfect headshot. Now to fire your weapon you have to first right click which will give you a crosshair and then left click. This is sort of a semi accurate hip fire style way of shooting. If you want extreme accuracy for long range shooting you have to right click and then hold shift on PC and that will give you the ability to aim down sights. When matchmaking you can either join with a friend, a random player, or you can solo queue. If you solo queue however you will be going up against other teams of two. Hopefully they'll add solo matchmaking at some point but for the time being especially if you're just starting out you are at a pretty big disadvantage if you're playing by yourself. There's no total player counter in the game like other battle royales, so it helps to keep track of how many players you've killed or how many dead players you've seen around the map. That might give you a better idea of how many people are left in the game since there's only 10 total, including yourself. Now sounds and audio cues are important in any first person shooter, but probably more so in Hunt Showdown than any game I've ever played. Audio cues will be your number one tool for locating enemy players, whether you want to engage them or run away from them, you're gonna need to keep your ears perked. Now in-game comms can actually be heard by everyone, so if your teammate can hear you using the in-game sound system, anybody within proximity of you can also hear that. Be aware, I've actually located a few enemy players because I've heard them talking to each other. Oh, I see him, I see him. I oh, know it's a zombie, it's a zombie, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, using the chat system also can be seen by enemy players, so just be aware that any sort of in-game communication is proximity based and can be heard by all other enemies, and uh, if you're getting serious about the game you may want to consider using something like TeamSpeak or Discord. Now as for other audio cues, the things you want to listen out for are obviously enemy weapon fire. This can be heard from pretty much across the map and so it can be an easy way to locate enemies or at least tell you what direction they're in. The sounds in this game are incredible so it can really give you a good idea of like how far away they are. 400 meters, 100 meters, are they right next to you? There's also a lot of little environmental triggers. There's tons of them actually. So for example, flocks of crows are all over the map. If you get too close to them, they'll fly away making a loud sound and can be seen at a distance so enemy players will be able to tell where you are. Also, there are dying horses scattered around the map and they will start neighing once you get close to them making a loud sound that other enemies can hear. Dogs and chickens as well will start barking or clucking and basically give away your position. In addition to that, there's also things like broken glass and hanging chains. Walking over broken glass will make a loud sound and walking through chains will also make a loud sound. But if you crouch walk, you will reduce the sound of broken glass or make no sound when going past chains. Opening doors can also give away your position if you're trying to silently infiltrate a building. If you crouch while opening a door, it'll reduce that sound. Let's talk a little bit about your weapons and gear. First of all, to get weapons and gear, you need to recruit a hunter. And these hunters all have different weapons, different gear. Look for one that is going to be most beneficial to your play style. Hunters can also come with traits that give them in-game perks. One of the best ones at the start is Quartermaster, as it allows you to carry two primary weapons instead of one primary and a sidearm. This will allow you to carry a double barrel shotgun and a long rifle for hitting targets at range. This gives you a pretty well-rounded character, although generally a little bit more expensive. There's three different tiers of hunters as well. You can only unlock tier 1 hunters until you hit rank 33. Then you can unlock tier 2 hunters and tier 1 hunters, and when you hit rank 66, you'll be able to unlock tier 3 hunters. The higher tier hunters cost a little bit more money, but they'll also come with higher level weapons and better traits. Most tier 1 hunters will come with the Winfield lever action rifle. This is a good rifle, it's accurate at range, it can one shot headshot a lot of hunters, so 
keep that in mind, use it as a marksman rifle, but it's got a fast enough rate of fire to be effective in close quarters when needed. The problem is that shotguns are so incredibly good in close quarters that if you go up against somebody with a shotgun and you've got this one, you better hope you hit a headshot. Once you also get a little bit more experienced at this game, I would also recommend picking up a cheap melee weapon like a knife or a duster. This will allow you to switch to something to take down uh, zombies a bit quicker than bashing them with your rifle. And this way you can move through the map stealthily and a bit faster than you could before. There's also some higher level melee weapons like the saber that do a huge amount of damage and can serve your stamina really well, but that's something that you'll unlock at bloodline rank. 50. So don't worry about that now. You can certainly get by just fine with knives and other things. There's also a suppressed revolver in the game, which is a great tool for taking out enemy zombies and other monsters without making a huge amount of sound. Taking out monsters in the game rewards you with a lot of experience. So if you can do it silently and quickly, it's a good way to sort of rank up your character. All right, let's talk about health bars, different types of damage, and healing. As far as I know, tier one hunters start off with 100 health. This can be broken up into two different health bars, or it can be broken up into three different health bars, depending on which hunter you recruit. If your hunter survives a match and you get some decent experience points, you can rank up your hunter and put a lot of those XP points into increasing your overall health pool. So you can upgrade your hunter to have 150 health total. Now there's benefits to having small health bars and large health bars, and you can actually choose when you upgrade if you want to upgrade with a big health bar or two small health bars. If you take a small amount of damage that doesn't deplete one of your health bars, that health bar will recharge in a short period of time. If you take fire damage, that health bar will recharge in a longer period of time. However, if you take enough damage so that your health bar gets completely depleted, it will not recharge on its own. In addition to that, if you take fire damage and that fire damage depletes a health bar, that health bar is gone permanently from that hunter. There's no way you can gain that health back other than finishing the round, surviving, and buying another health bar with your experience gained. A health bar that is depleted but you can heal back up is indicated by a black bar on the user interface, but if it's been destroyed, it's indicated by a clear bar on the interface. So just keep that in mind. Now, when you go down in the game but you're playing with a teammate so they have the potential of reviving you and they do so successfully, you will be revived but with one less health bar permanently. Now, if you're incapacitated or damaged with fire enough to the point where you only have one health bar remaining and you are knocked out or incapacitated, even if you have a teammate, your hunter is dead permanently. So keep that in mind and it may be worthwhile to just try and extract once you're down to one single remaining health bar if you don't want to lose that hunter. So in that sense, you could argue that it makes more sense to have a bunch of small health bars rather than lesser large health bars as you will have more chances of being downed and still being able to revive. However, the small health bars have a much higher chance of being completely depleted when taking damage, and then you'll be forced to use more medical supplies to fully heal up your health bar. So there's pros and cons to either approach, but at the moment I'm thinking if you're playing in duos and you're getting a bit more serious, it might just make more sense to go with more smaller health bars and just eat the cost of more medical supplies. If I'm being honest though, at the very start of the game, you may not want to invest too much in medical supplies because chances are you're going to get ganked by a bunch of players and you'll just lose them anyway. So get used to the game before you start spending too much money on your loadouts. Now, when it comes to using the environment for your advantage, this is a pretty darn cool game. Aside from having incredibly thick and dense foliage that you can hide in, camp and shoot from behind trees, there's also a lot of cool little triggers that you can use to your advantage in combat. Explosive barrels, the big red ones, explode a lot bigger than you think. Even though the explosion graphic isn't huge, it will down people from way far away. So keep that in mind in a firefight. If you see somebody standing near one, go for that. It might kill them a lot faster. Kerosene lamps are all over the world. Some of them you can pick up and throw at monsters, which will actually kill a lot of bigger monsters pretty easily without having to take a shot and make a lot of sound. Some kerosene lamps don't move, but they can be turned on or off. If a kerosene lamp is turned on and you shoot it, it will explode in flame. This can be a fun way to take out enemies that are chasing you, including other players. Some doors in the environment will actually have a plank of wood near them that you can use to barricade the door. If you want to get through a barricaded door, you can use weapons, but if you find a big sledgehammer lying around, you can pick that up and also use that to bash through a barricade.
Now there's several different types of enemies in this world that you need to be worried about. The most basic are grunts. These are zombies. Now the basic zombie is not particularly fast and it doesn't do a huge amount of damage and you can usually kill them with melee weapons pretty easily. Then there's zombies that also carry cleavers which will cause you to bleed and lose life until you bandage yourself. And then there's also zombies that carry torches and they will cause you to catch on fire when they hit you successfully. You need to worry about these zombies a bit more as they will cause way more damage damage over time. If you do catch on fire, you can either put it out by patting yourself down or jumping in some nearby water. The next enemies are hellhounds, and these are basically just demon dogs. They generally move in packs. They're much more alertable than other monsters out there, and you can't really melee them. I mean, you can, but it's harder because of their pack nature. So a lot of the time you're gonna have to shoot them. Shotguns will scare them away, but you gotta watch out for these guys, as uh, even if you do kill them, you'll often alert your enemies of your presence. Then there's hives, or as I like to call them, bee ladies. And if you aggro these bee ladies, tons of wasps and insects and weird bugs will fly towards you, poison you, and cause a huge amount of damage. To kill hive ladies, you can sneak up on them and melee them, or you can just shoot them in the head with any rifle. They'll go down to one headshot or a couple of body shots. Then there's armored enemies, and as the name suggests, they have a lot of hit points. They're fast as well. Once they get close to you, it can be very hard to outrun them. Shotguns are decent for dealing with these guys as they'll knock them down with the force of the blast, giving you some time to sort of escape and get further away from them. I recommend avoiding these guys if you're worried that there's any hunters nearby or using a kerosene lamp to burn them down. Now, if you don't have a shotgun, you can also shoot them in the legs to slow them down. Then there's the giant meatheads, which uh, have their own little entourage of slug leeches that follow them around. These guys are bad news. They have a huge amount of health. You want to pretty much avoid them at all costs, unless you're just in the mood for killing something that's going to eat up all your ammo or take like four or five kerosene lamps to take down. Now, when playing with duos, there's a few interesting tactics that come into play. Some of these tactics are born out of the fact that there's no time limit in Hunt Showdown, at least not currently. So if your partner goes down in duos, but they are in a revivable state, you have the option of reviving them immediately, or if it's a little too hot and the enemy players are camping their body or waiting for you to go out for the revive, just wait or maybe retreat, hide somewhere. If they're not going after your teammate's body by trying to ignite it with a kerosene lamp or a Molotov cocktail, which will kill them permanently, then you have all the time in the world. And I've seen multiple duos partners do this where one player will be more aggressive and if he goes down, then the other player will just back off for a while and wait to come back in to revive the body. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of the tactic and I do wish that there was actually a time limit for revives, but since it's in the game now, you can certainly take it advantage of it. All right, let's talk about the actual objective play and the end game. When you first get into a match and you hold E, this will activate your dark vision and it'll show you little blue areas around the map that indicate a clue. Going up to a clue and collecting it will reduce the size of your map in which the enemy boss can be located. Collecting all three clues will show you exactly where the enemy boss is. You get a lot of money and experience for collecting clues in general, so it's pretty much necessary to do this in order to progress in the game. Once you've located the enemy boss, you kind of have to make a decision of, are you gonna try and fight the boss? Are you gonna try and fight other players who have located the boss? Are you gonna camp them? Are you gonna camp the extraction points? There's a lot of different approaches you can take to this. If you go and fight the boss, you get a lot of experience just for discovering the boss's lair. You get a lot of experience for killing the boss. And then once the boss is dead, you can then banish their body. Once you start a banishment ritual, it shows every player on the map where this banishment ritual is taking place and they can come and try and hunt you down. Furthermore, once the ritual is complete, the boss will drop two bounties, one for you and one for your partner. If your partner dies, the second bounty can actually be picked up by another player, or the bounties can actually just be picked up by other players in general. So if you're killed while the ritual is taking place, too bad somebody else gets the bounties that you worked for. Once you pick up the bounty, your objective is now to try and make it to an extraction point without getting killed by other players or enemies. If you make it, you get a lot of cash and experience. The catch though is that once you're holding a bounty, basically anyone can activate dark vision and it will show them a lightning storm over your head. So it makes it very easy for them to track you down. 
killing a boss and extracting the bounty is one of the hardest things you can do in this game. When you're killing the boss, you'll usually be making so much sound from the gunfire that other players will be able to not only locate you, but sneak up on you during the firefight. This can be really bad, and I've died many times mid-boss fight. So sometimes if you're playing duos, it might make more sense to have one player on lookout while the other player is fighting the boss. Even if you do successfully kill the boss and try and escape with your bounty, often players will camp the extraction points closest to the boss fight, so it can make a lot of sense to try and go for the longer range extraction points. Then again, you're always going to be spotted by that lightning storm over your head, so if a smart player positions themselves right, they're usually going to be able to engage you before you make it out of the map. So it's a very difficult situation to be in, and you and your partner have to be on your toes. All right, let's talk about how you gain experience and money. These two things are important to progressing your character and also buying better equipment for your character with the money or the bounty as it is referred to often in the game. All the monsters in the world will give you experience for killing them, so it does make sense to farm monsters if you think you're safe. Grunts will give you 10 experience. These are the basic zombies. And if you go all the way up to meatheads, which are the hardest monsters to kill, those will give you 100 experience. And then of course the boss is worth 250 experience. Killing enemy players gives you 150 experience. Now, if you die in a round and you're not able to extract all the experience you gained that game, you'll still get it, but it will be cut in half. So keep that in mind if you're having an excellent round, but you're down to one bar health and things aren't looking so great, it might be better just to extract rather than uh, risking losing all that experience or a huge chunk of it. Now, playing the objective gives you both experience and cash. When you find a clue, each one of those clues is worth 100 experience and 25 US dollars. Then discovering the monster layer gives you 200 experience and $25. Killing the boss, as I said before, awards you 250 experience, but also $50 and then find Finally, extracting the monster's bounty gives you 200 experience and $150. So basically, PTFOing not only gives you a lot of extra experience, but also a huge amount of cash so that you can buy upgraded weapons or upgraded hunters and try and be more effective the next time around. Anyway, that covers a lot of the basics of how this game works. I hope it alleviates some of the growing pains and processes of learning the game world and figuring out strategies to help you win and gain money and XP. As always, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is Level Cap, signing off.